Welcome to Cinemaholics. This is a bonus episode where we are going to talk about Big Red himself. That's right, Clifford, the Big Red Dog. I think, Will Ashen, your most anticipated movie of 2021? Uh, I don't believe so, no. Then why do you keep texting me about it? Why do I keep getting phone calls in because the night? Because it's a dog that's big and red. When else When else have we seen that at the movies? I've just never seen you so animated, so excited. You're more animated than the dog in this movie. Sure. To talk about Clifford. I should say, there was actually, I think, one other Clifford movie before this one, right? The 1994 film? Really, yeah, Clifford's really big movie or something like that. I've never seen it. I, so let's talk about Clifford real quick. There are books. There's a cartoon on PBS. What's your what's your relationship to Clifford? You love the dog? Is he a good boy? I read the books, um, or at least a few of them as a kid. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't. I think it's fair to say that if you've read one Clifford book, you've read them all, and that. The plot is kind of uh, interchangeable. Yeah, it's uh, like, look at this really fun place, but Clifford's so yeah. big. Um, there's a now canceled comedian who does a really great bit about that, uh, you know, and uh, yeah, it's just like, you know, it is what it is. It's just, uh, it's Clifford. He's a dog. He's really big. And people are like, this is an inconvenience. You are way too big. Yeah. You can't go in the firehouse. <laughs> you can't go on the bridge. You can't, you know, whatever. But when people tell Clifford he can't, he does. Yeah. But there's also the um, the PBS show, I remember. Uh, I think John Ritter was the voice he of was. Clifford. Did you watch it? I watched a little bit of it. I think mainly because that was around when my sisters were uh, kids. So I remember it that because we didn't have cable growing up. So we had a lot of PBS in our house. Yeah, you were in Arthur I remember, house. You were, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mostly just remember the theme song. I don't know if you've heard the the theme song for the show, but um, I never watched it. Yeah, because only nerds watched PBS. No, I'm just kidding. We, I just never yeah, really yeah. watched PBS except for Arthur. And yeah. I never well, watched someone, Sesame Street. I missed out on a lot of PBS stuff. You never watched Sesame Street? No, not, I, don't, I don't think I watched a single episode. Really? That, no, that's, a, that's a revelation. Didn't right we talk there. about that when we talked about no, Street Gang? No. I thought I was pretty clear. Yeah, I, I didn't really grow up with Sesame Street. It wasn't really, it wasn't really on. I liked Muppets. Sure. Who doesn't? But I remember, like, for me, the kids' programming was on VHS. I'd get that stuff. I, I didn't want to have to live by the network schedule. Well, that wasn't my life. Sure. I mean, that's a conversation for another day. I guess I could talk your ear off about PBS, but my... <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll explain. It's not that I hated yeah. PBS. It's because I, my mom was a teacher, right? So, like, I was always at school, like, all day. Like, I never came home. I didn't, you know, I didn't watch anything during those hours. By the time, like, I'm home... I don't think PBS had stuff on. So you had to go to Nick at Night? Yeah, I watched so much Nick at Night, it's scary. And I watched so much um, Family Guy and Adult Swim and like adult stuff that I I probably shouldn't have. I, I, I had not the great greatest babysitter, babysitter being my older sister. Yeah, but anyway, uh, suffice to say, Clifford, I have grown up with it. I'm not like a mega fan or anything. I don't know if anyone is really a big mega fan. I'm sure somebody is out there, but maybe I don't know. Uh, I like it. I'm nostalgic for it. Uh, I kind of figured there was going to be a time when we got a live action Clifford movie because uh, I figured it was inevitable. And I'm surprised it took this long, to be honest. Sure. Well, they were going to make a movie about Clifford back in 2012. I think Universal and Elimination were working on something for this, but they canceled it. And I mean, you can probably see why, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, this was around the time I think like Smurfs had come out and sure. We, it was just like an era of let's take this classic nostalgic cartoon or book or whatever and put it in New York City. And that counted as a script back then. Yeah. And I mean, this one just didn't yeah. die. It came out eventually. Right. I mean, I don't see this as a compliment or a slight. This feels like a script that was written in 1998, like around the time Stuart Little came out. And they just kind of have like oh, yeah. reworked it to include modern references and whatnot. And then somehow it just eventually got to be in like, we should do a Clifford movie. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, do we have a script? Oh, yeah, we have one in the drawer. Yeah, sure. Just, just give it a punch up and we're good to go. And uh, somebody procrastinated yeah. and forgot. And then their their version of punching it up was like one or two references to cyberbullying. And that's about it. Yeah. Well, I just mean that like when I say 98, just feel it feels like kind of like a New York of like the 90s. Like, before yeah, 9/11, squeaky where clean. It's like this, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Really clean. Like there's like this kind of raw, raw spirit for the community, like this optimism. Harriet just the being, Spy. Like, Sure, yeah, Harriet. Sp- I love Harriet Spy. Of course, Great movie. Of course, yeah. yeah. This is this does feel like a Nickelodeon movie in a lot of ways, and it is technically, I guess, right because this is on Paramount Plus. It's coming out on yeah. Paramount Plus and theaters simultaneously. So that's how that's how we watched it. I mean, I don't think well, you you went to the theater to see Clifford, right? 
Oh no! Okay. Yeah, <laughs> if I went to the theater by myself to see Clifford, I would be like, "What am I? What am I doing?" With yeah, you'd be having a crisis right about now. Um, I mean, we had a crisis just by watching this movie, anyway. But anyway, I. I Guys, I guess sort of like you, I, I, I wouldn't. I was never like write or die for this. Like when I was at the Scholastic Book Fair, I wasn't cleaning the shelves of Clifford books. I'll be honest, but it was always like around. You know, it's, it, Clifford was always there for you when you when you needed him, and then you didn't always need him. You know what I mean? Like he was just sort of like, all right, there's nothing else to read. Stone Soup is on the back burner. Somebody's already reading it. So here, here's a Clifford book. I'll go. I'll go with that. Well, you know, I mean, when the world changes and you're going through puberty and you don't know what's happening there is a comfort in like i know what i'm gonna get when i open clifford he's gonna be a dog, <laughs> dog he's gonna be red going he's gonna be big and you know i mean some things just never change and that's the case for clifford that's true that's true so clifford the big red dog the film uh, as we've already mentioned takes place in new york city and, and yeah it's the origin story of clifford which i'm sure we needed right uh, why is he so big and uh, although they don't really explain exactly why he's so big except with like because he's loved and if you love something it makes it bigger and uh, I don't love that explanation because it has a lot of, I think, <laughs> some some intellectual philosophical quandaries that just sort of brings in of, of other things. Get I, I don't know. I don't want to go there, but sure. We follow Emily Elizabeth Howard, the classic Emily. Although you you made a complaint to me while you were watching the film that she isn't blonde in this. Do you want to address your complaint for that here? I I don't know if there's more to add to that. I just like in the book she's blonde with like pigtails, right? You're asking the wrong person. Well, I haven't read a Clifford book I... in 20 years or something. Yeah, I just I thought she has a like very distinct like uh, on the side ponytail blonde hair, and this she's like a brunette basically. I think she's kind of like reddish hair. I guess I I don't know. I, I was just know. curious why you cared. No, I don't know. It's not that I like care care. I just was like, huh. It was an observation. I was just like, why is she yeah. not blonde? Like that was like such a distinct feature of her in the books. I just see you like right putting like grading this movie, and you have A, and then you see that she has like red <laughs> hair, and then you put the a B. minus. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so so emily she doesn't fit in she's having trouble at home and at school uh the movie kind of ex- it says off the bat that like she just moved here and so you're like okay be, being the new kid is tough i get that you know she's at school and people like the the main insult that gets thrown at her is like new girl and i'm just like that's an insult it's like yeah she's new what, what? So I was a little confused at that part, but yeah, so she's new and apparently that's like a crisis and, but she goes home and she lives in this like mystical, like, I guess Harlem apartment complex where everybody knows each other. They all know her by name. And I'm like, well, if she just moved here, how do all of the neighbors know her? What dream world New York city is this? Well, I mean, I know you've been in New York. I have too. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is a genderfied version of Harlem where, uh, you know, a struggling mother and child, uh, single parent can live in what appears to be like a 3000 yeah. plus a month <laughs> apartment. Uh, Send you know. her kid to private school. But I think they say that yeah. she goes for free for some reason. And also her mother has a British accent, even though she and her uncle don't. And they tr- they explain so it. Confusing. But it is well, this sort of thing. It's like, OK, wh- yeah. why did why? Why didn't they just get an actor with like an American accent and you just don't have to explain it? I here's my thing. I'm fine if they were both British because Jack Whitehall is British in real life. I'm not familiar yeah, with yeah. the actress that plays the mom. I don't know if she's actually British or doing an accent. Um, I'm assuming she's actually British, but see, it's fine. Sienna Guillory and okay, yeah, yeah, she's been in a bunch of stuff. Like she was in Love Actually. She's British. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, so she is British. I figured I just wasn't. I didn't want to say for sure. We've gotten in trouble for assuming people's accents and uh, backgrounds and all that, but um. Yeah, I, I just don't get like, okay, they're both British and they're just immigrants. Okay, I'd be fine with that. But it's like, oh, no, Jack Whitehall is American. It's just like, okay, then we got this weird, like, Doctor Strange kind of American accent that he's trying to do. And it's like, okay. I thought he did. Actually, you know, I thought it was convincing. Yeah. Uh, okay, you then didn't? I guess we disagree. No, I was not convinced at all. Really? <laughs> but, okay, uh, yeah. well, you know, I, we just saw him in Jungle Cruise. So we are hot off of him, like, having the thickest British accent at, sure. of his career, probably. Yeah, but I don't know. I just, yeah, I... I I don't want to belabor this point, but yeah, just I thought it was an odd choice to make one British, but one not British, and then I try to explain it. Just uh, it just seemed like it would have been way easier just to make them both British or both American or whatever. But whatever, that's fine. That's fine. We don't we don't have to to dwell on it. It's just this random thing that it just made me wonder, like why, like <laughs> like what? I don't know. It was a needless thing to add to this movie. But anyway, so Emily is struggling. She's having a hard time, even though she has like tons of friends like at home and it's fine she 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 wants to be more confident she wants to be a little bit a little bit more bold right so her uncle is watching her for the weekend or for the week or whatever it is her mom's out of town her uncle casey played by jack whitehall he's a bit of a klutz 
just kind of a clumsy oafy guy can't can't land a job he's an illustrator you know what that's gonna mean for the end of the movie it's gonna do the elf thing sure but he's he's watching her but he's very irresponsible and they come across this uh this like animal sort of tent where there's this like red dog a little, little red dog at this point and he loves emily immediately but after she after he sneaks into her bag and again i'm pointing this out specifically because like these are just examples of how this movie just does not function like a a script that somebody really sat down and read before they like hit publish and it's like this dog is in her backpack for an entire day and she didn't notice D- did she not open her bag to get her books because she she comes across him at the beginning of the day will before school starts yeah I don't know. <laughs> you open the bag. One of a million things in this movie that just <laughs> look. I I know a lot goes into making a movie, especially a big special effects driven film like this. And I don't want to disparage anyone's work, but there are a lot of creative uh, choices in here that felt, uh, for lack of a better word, kind of lazy. Uh, yeah. So yeah, there's so many other things you could do to have the dog kind of sneak to. You didn't have to do something that doesn't make sense anyway. But again, that's just another thing where the movie is just dumb and it's just stupid and they don't try to fix it. And it made me feel like if they don't even care enough to fix the little things like that, that anybody could catch in the development process, why should I care? I guess, I guess that's like my main thing with this movie is like, why should I care about any of this if it clearly doesn't care about itself? And then the dog gets big. Oh, you better believe it. <laughs> Not that big. He kind of- Not big enough. He's like, what, like 10 feet? Which, like, I don't know, the yeah. Clifford I remember is, like, that dog is a kaiju. Yes. Okay? <laughs> We're not talking he's about... He's at least 12 feet. Like, I mean, he's the size of a building, literally. And, I mean, like, in this one, he's... I don't he's know, a dire they, wolf. They try to, I mean, he's just... Yeah. yeah. They try to explain a way that, like, he's a puppy in this. So, I'm guessing that if they make a sequel, he's going to be, you know, even larger than he was before. But I don't buy yeah. it. I think they cut corners. I think he needs to be big from the onset. Clifford, the bigger red dog. You got to make a, an impression, right? And I think this could actually have a sequel, Will, because, I mean, it's not a box office sensation, but it has made $23 million. And I, I'm not, I, I might just like break even, I guess, but I imagine that it's doing okay on Paramount Plus as well. So sure. we could be getting Clifford, the bigger red dog. Maybe. Yeah. We'll see. Here's my main criticism with this movie because, so like, he's a big dog and they don't know what to do about it. And I, I actually will like, I like, the fact that he's kind of a puppy that makes it fun but so much of clifford is just he just does normal dog stuff the whole time while big and that's it yeah which that's is the whole true movie. to the source material i mean that's basically it yeah what what's the point i mean i don't know it's like these scenes are supposed to be comedic i guess he plays fetch but he's a big and yes he's supposed to have all this personality emily and him are supposed to have this deep connection and i didn't yes. buy it at all D- um I, I think the child actress is good in this, and I think she does well enough with the material. Darby Camp, but Big Little Lies. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, she was, um, wasn't she Reese Witherspoon's, like, youngest daughter in that show? Yeah, she was super yeah, precocious. Yeah. We also, she was also in uh, The Christmas Chronicles and oh, the sequel yeah, of that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 I remember now. Um, yeah, she seems like a good kid actress. And I think she does well. And, you know, it's not easy to act opposite a big CG dog, and I don't know if people have seen, like, behind the scenes pictures of like what uh, clifford looked like on set but i i, I imagine that funny was a stuff. hard challenge funny stuff yeah yeah but um yeah i mean i think she she makes it, i think more tolerable than it would be otherwise but at the same time this is such a fairly retrograde family film in that it's just kind of going through the basics like we said before it just feels like they dusted off the script from decades earlier the type of uh family movies i would get like you know the pages would be Xerox. They would just kind of scratch off a couple things, change names, and you know, kind of uh, shoot the script as uh, as it was many years before, and just go with it. And it doesn't really uh, change the formula or uh, spin any new wheels or anything like that. It just it does what you expect it to do, which I guess is fitting for a Clifford the Big Red Dog movie. But at the same time, those books are what twenty pages max. Uh, yeah. and this is a 90 minute film, which I, I'm glad we're getting 90 minute films, but I also feel like even an mm. hour of Clifford is kind of, uh, stretching the limit of what Clifford can do in a narrative fashion. It's 97 minutes. So yeah, an extra seven on top of that, but yeah. Okay. So I, I want to make it clear. Like we didn't have like gargantuan expectations for this, right? Like who did? I wasn't, I wasn't going into Clifford expecting some kind of, you know, innovation weren't big for this one 
<laughs> yeah, you, big you caught the pun. Yeah, yeah. But hey, look, like when I go into these movies, when I go into kid movies, right, and I'm watching them and I don't have a kid with me, right, I'm just, I, I like to feel like a kid again. There is like a a draw to that of like, oh man, you know, like getting washed up and, and swept up and, and the fun of like a kid's movie and the stakes are low. Like we see movies like that that can be really fulfilling, like Paddington. I thought, you know, Tom and Jerry was like that to a small extent. And I guess like if I had to say one thing about this movie, that was like, mm, that's a level that I think if they had nailed it for like the whole movie had been on the same level, we could have had something pretty cool here. And that's that's Tony Hale. What do, what do you think of Tony Hale as the villain here? Um, I mean, he was fine, I guess. Didn't really stand out to me more or less than any of the other actors. I really certainly wasn't. What was that? He's so funny. Yeah, no, he's I having mean, a good time. He's having a good time. I agree with you on that. Um, I mean, he brings a little bit more enthusiasm to it. Like I said, I'll say that the child actress, I don't really think any of the performances, certainly from the adults, did much for me. I mean, John Cleese was, uh, you know, dependable. Yeah, he should have. Uh, Sure. couple scenes for him and there are a few other people who show up in this movie where i'm like why did you take this job you're better than yeah. this uh, rosie perez yeah what was up with that yeah what? <laughs> you're rosie perez like what, what, why do you have a like a glorified cameo like i, I don't know like it seems so beneath her right well i just thought like well surely if rosie perez is in this like she's gonna have like some third act like yeah like bring her back in or it. she's mm-hmm. you know key to the plot but then nope that was that was it. They, they uh, couldn't they couldn't get somebody else to anyway. I, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, maybe she just has kids or grandkids that are like really in the cliffer, and she was just like, I want to do it for them. I'm just gonna kind of like, yeah. I'm I'm not sure if that's the case at all, but I would hope that's the case as opposed to like, I'm running out of options. What should I do? And it's like, well, Cl- Clifford's always here. You can, hey, he's always he's always on the bookshelf. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's there for you. Okay, I, I've seen some people unironically go to bat for this movie and say, like, you know what? It's not a great movie, but I have a big heart for it. Sure. I've seen critics who have trashed good movies in the past, but with Clifford, they're like, no, 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 this is it. This is this is the one that I'm going to I'm going to defend. And I think the sentiment I'm seeing is, well, it's cute cute movie it's sweet has its heart in the right place you, you can't stay mad at it and i kind of right. get that like same thing it's like you know it's got those puppy dog eyes you know sure what do you think about that uh i think what the movie is intention as far as the movie's intentions i think they're fine like i think it's a fairly innocent film as far as what it's trying to do and trying to honor the source material and all that and if that gets somebody through their day with a little bit more ease, I can't fault that. But I, uh, as we suggested already, I, I don't think this movie is especially well made or interesting as far as uh, how it tackles the source material or how it uh, approaches family film entertainment. I, I guess I, I get like some people are just like, look, now everything's going to be Paddington. But if you're going into a film like Clifford, like you want certain amount of things and it delivers in that respect, I can, I guess, understand and and see where that's coming from. But at the same time, like I couldn't this be something more. I don't know. It just feels like it's at best fine at worst, kind of a slog. It's not really interesting or funny to me because I mean, most of the jokes are directed, I guess, towards children and that's fine. Like I'm not, I'm not saying every movie needs to be uh, for adults, but I think there are certainly a lot of other films in this vein that have done more and better things with this type of material. For instance, like I said, like Stuart Little, I think that's a film that's kind of trying to do the same thing. And I think that one's a little bit better at it. But um, yeah, I don't know. This one just kind of when I saw those reviews, I was left with a shrug. I'm like, I don't know. I mean, good for them, I guess. But sure. I don't know what, what they're getting out of this. I mean, that's the thing. I was like the film. It doesn't really offer anything. And may- maybe it's my history with animated movies and-, and movies that tend to have even when they're not perfect, even when they have glaring issues. I always like it when a movie has like a surprising message. This is not one of those movies, not even close. I mean, the message of this movie is you got to you got to stand up for yourself and and being different is a gift and it's like okay, like what what hasn't been about that? Like what what does this movie offer that's different? And I mean, if you're going to make an adaptation of a story that's existed for so long and with this character that's been around for so long, you should find a unique angle on it. Like you should make it a little bit cause kids aren't that dumb. <laughs> I guess they're just making this for like little, little kids, but it also has a little bit of like humor in it. That's, 
I don't know. Like, I guess it's supposed to be for the parents, but I, I, if I was, if I had like a young, young kid watching this, I don't know if they'd be that into it because there's a lot of adult stuff that happens in it. Right. Sure. I mean, the body count, as far as I've <laughs> estimated, is between one and five, which is more than I expected for a film uh, called Clifford the Big Red Dog, I'll admit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I guess I just, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I, like I said before, it's not that I expect much from a Clifford movie, but I, again, I just think this is a case of like, they really didn't try that hard. There wasn't that much effort. I think the people putting the most effort are probably the actors, it seems like, because they try really hard to sell lines that don't make sense and things that happen that don't make sense. I mean, there's so much like they never explain like, why don't they just go to like, they're trying to find Bridwell, you know, which is a nod to the original author, but you know, he's the one played by John Cleese. And they're like, we got to find him because he can probably solve the problem. And nobody ever mentions like, why don't you just go to the place where you found him in the first place? Right. Like they never explain that later on in the movie. They're like, well, we know that he's not there anymore. It's like, well, how do you know you didn't go there? And I guess like, that's what I mean by the laziness. Like clearly there was like some sort of scene or explanation for maybe they tried to find him and they didn't, and they just cut it out of the movie because they were like, well, we gotta, we gotta cut this thing down. I mean, (laughs) it's too long. Well, I also find it weird that like the movie kind of like, uh, there, there are certain obvious scenes where they're like, we got to hide Clifford. Like people can't see Clifford. They're going to freak out. And then like a couple scenes later, just like walking around in public (laughs) with Clifford, like it's no big deal. (laughs) And there are a couple scenes where I think the only real genuine laughs I got out of this film where, like, when they kind of played that up with, like, New Yorkers, just like, well, you know, like, they're just kind of about their day and just, yeah. like, not paying attention. Or, like, yeah, there's, yeah. like, a scene where, like, a truck's rattling and you see, like, a woman, like, look at it, confused and, like, shrug. And I'm like, okay, that's, like, cute. That's, like, that's, funny joke. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good It's like, level. yeah. Right. I, and if the movie was, like, that throughout, where everyone's, like, aware of Clifford but, like, not reacting or acknowledging him, I think I would have respected it more. But it kind of seems like it's going for a bunch of different things where it's, like, sometimes people are, like shocked and awe at clifford and sometimes people are just kind of mindlessly unaware of him and then sometimes they have to like even pretend he's not even there and yeah whenever it's him. convenient for the plot that's the case right although like, i i agree with you because like there was one character that i got a laugh from the superintendent because like sometimes they are so over the top like some of the neighbor characters in a way that i think is you know kind of fun uh, like for example like the superintendent toward the end is like and that's why you don't break the rules and he sells that line <laughs> like it's just such a like hammy cheesy thing but i don't know if, if more of the movie had been like that and like i said before tony hale and like just a little bit more cartoony make it a cartoon but i think there were times when the movie wanted to also take itself semi-seriously and i don't think it quite works so yeah that's clifford uh, not great yeah well how'd you feel about the side kid character he's pretty annoying but, okay i mean he's not bad or anything but I don't know. So he's played by Isaac Wang and he's just kind of like a, he has like a crush on Emily and sure. he, I guess he's the owner of T-Bone from the, from the cartoon and books. I, yeah. 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 It's whatever. I thought he was a little cringy, but I wasn't, sure. I, kept, I wasn't that mad. I was just kind of, uh, amused that like his character spends like basically days with Emily and her, um, uncle. Oh yeah. I was thinking about that too. Where it's just- and to the point where it's just like, aren't the parents like concerned at all? And then we meet the dad. He just kind of just like, oh, hey, there you are. Yeah. There's my son. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Didn't go to school today. Haven't known where you are. Yeah. <laughs> the, the movie has like a weird, yeah, that kind of weird logic. Of, this is the only thing that matters right now. Kind of going on. Once Clifford is there, just time just stops. Yeah. <laughs> like Everyone's just like, hang on, hang on. What's going on here? Uh, this was directed by Walt Becker, forgot to mention, who did... The uh, the last Alvin and the Chipmunks movie, The Road Chip. But I did uh, I did get tickled by yeah. the fact that this is the Van Wilder guy. Yeah. Like, his career is so funny. Like, he does Van Wilder Started. and Wild Hogs yeah. and Old Hogs or Old Dogs. And then he makes an Alvin and the Chipmunks movie. And they're like, you've done it, Becker. <laughs> you mm. found your calling. Right. <laughs> and they give him the Clifford movie. Well, what a I career. Mean, I mean, was Van Wilder his first film or is just the first one that I think that was his first, popular? yeah. Because, I mean, that's a film where, you know, Van Wilder has, like, his pet dog. Who the big joke is that he has, like, these big, huge testicles. Oh, he did another. That, he did uh, Buying the Cow before. Oh, okay. That was another Ryan Reynolds film. Yep, yep. Um, Reynolds and Milano. But, no, I just, yeah. But I just remember uh, Van Wilder is, like, the whole thing where, like, the dog is, like, not neutered. So, he has, like, these big, distracting testicles. They're, like, large and everyone's noticed by them. And then 20 years later, he's making Clifford the Big Red Dog. <laughs> he, hey, he, he likes him some dog movies. And... Uh, okay. All right. Um, yeah. 
did you, you said you did see Clifford's really big movie? Oh, like a while ago. Okay. If you is it, tested me on anything that happened on it, I could not tell you. <laughs> yeah, and that was um I think that I said that was nineteen ninety four. I think that's two thousand four. Uh, right. and I, I never saw it, but uh, would you would you recommend that movie over this one or what would you would you just abstain? Um, if you were a super fan of Clifford, I think you'd get more out of Clifford completion. Clifford's really big movie. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I still think it's weird that Clifford talks, but I feel like that's like a little bit more colorful and inspired than this movie, which is just kind of going through the motions and, you know, just sort of plain in a very vanilla, but inoffensive sort of way, which I guess is why people are endeared by it, or at least some of our critics are. So, yeah, it's just fine. It's like I said, it's just mostly kind of boring and lazy for if anything, but if that's your thing have at it <laughs> all right well there you there you have it all right well let's play our little game here clifford the big red dog on rotten tomatoes 60 critics have uh, filed their reviews for clifford it's not getting a, a big critical reaction not a lot of people are sitting at the typewriter uh, you know w- wasting away for the review of clifford it's not not happening but uh they're having 60 reviews counted so far which again I, I think that's really low for what would normally be like a big summer sort of like kids comedy normally we'd at least have like over 100 but whatever well it's the, the fall now it's the fall now yeah it's a weird time yeah. to release a clifford movie it's going to be competing with a big disney animated film in just a week so what are you going to do but what do you think uh, the Rotten Tomato score is? Where do you think critics are are leaning on the consensus? I'm going to say right down the middle at 56%. You said 56? Yep, 56%. It is 48%. I don't know why since okay. you were that off. Really? Yeah, uh, yeah. I thought I was off on a couple of the audience scores recently, but not Audience scores are so much harder, though. But I think you usually get the audience, the, the critics score pretty close, like within five uh, points. Yeah, this one I was off. I don't know. I thought people would be kind of like, more so so than negative on it so i guess 56 percent. yeah it's yeah it's it's mixed to negative on the whole uh but what do you think about the audience score a lot of verified ratings 500 plus that's a bit more than usual that we count on these things where yeah what do you think audience is all right do you think they're telling this one to sit and stay i think they're hot but not like steaming hot on this like i think they're <laughs> warm to hot on the film hot but not uh, steaming hot okay yeah uh, so I'm going to say 74%, 94%. Yeah, you're, you're a little wow. off today. So well, I think they're hot. They're hot. I think, I think Clifford hot. just kind of like threw you off, threw off your game. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, Oh, I haven't looked at the, the cinema score. I don't even know if there is a cinema score. Um, okay. There is probably it's in theaters. It's I mean, Yeah. Yeah. The, the Vegas crowd got to it, but okay. So what do you think the cinema score is? Um, B plus it's an A. It's an A. Wow, they just love it. <laughs> They're like, big city, big dog. What's not the like? <laughs> All right. Well, this wasn't your your finest hour uh, in the guessing game. I I sure. would do not assume that I would do any better. So <laughs> there you go, Clifford the Big Red Dog. Now available to stream on Paramount Plus. You can also watch it in theaters. It is just ninety seven minutes long. Thank you so much for listening to our show. Be sure to subscribe to Cinemaholics on your favorite podcast app of choice or find us on YouTube. See you all next time.